Income tax, 2023-2024. Depreciation overview. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to stop the tax man in his tracks with income tax preparation. Well, maybe we can't stop him, but we'll, we're going to slow him down here. We're going to slow him down. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information comes from Publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula, which is a little funny because the schedule C in and of itself, basically an income statement, having income minus business expenses, which could be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls from Schedule C to Line 1 income of the formula. The formula basically outlining the calculation for page 1 of Form 1040. We see here Schedule C ultimately rolling into Line 8, additional income from Schedule 1. Here is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, part number 1 additional income schedule c rolling into line three business income or loss from the schedule c here is the schedule c it's a profit or loss from business has an income statement format income minus expenses we've been focusing in on the expenses which has the largest amount of category items typically some of those category items being more complex and confusing than others and therefore we'll be spending our time on these expenses or business deductions in more detail, diving this time in to depreciation. Depreciation is gonna be one of those areas that often causes a lot of problems when we get into business type of taxable entities. So a couple things just to keep in mind, noting that if you have a Schedule C that you're preparing for taxes, you're going to need, of course, some kind of bookkeeping to do that. You're going to need an income statement. So the question then is, who's going to help with the bookkeeping? Are we going to help the client with the bookkeeping? Or do we have some other people that we network with to help out with the bookkeeping? And even if the bookkeeping is done, we're handed an income statement. The income statement is perfect. They could not have done a better job on the bookkeeping side of things. There are some items we're still going to have to make adjustments for, which takes some kind of bookkeeping knowledge. One of those is going to be depreciation. Why can't the bookkeeper do depreciation, you might ask? Well, typically the bookkeeper is going to do things often that deal with cash transactions because they're going to be more and more using these bank feeds if they're using software like a QuickBooks software to record most of the things. Depreciation is one of those things that we have to deviate from a cash-based system to an accrual-based system because the tax code forces us to, which, to do that, which makes sense. It kind of lines up with what we need to do for generally accepted accounting principles as well because the time that we use the property is a lot different from the time that we might buy the property and therefore we do this accrual thing putting it on the books as an asset and then depreciating it 
Now, even if you had a bookkeeper that was versed in depreciation accrual methods and they know the straight line method and the double declining method and so on, they still probably aren't going to be able to perfectly do the depreciation because the depreciation for books, common depreciation methods, straight line versus double declining, for example, are still going to be slightly different or possibly very different than the tax code, which basically took generally accepted accounting principles and then altered them, not based on accounting, but based on whatever lobbyists and laws and wanting to frontline depreciate, try to stimulate the economy, politics, and all that kind of stuff. Therefore, no matter what happens, we're going to have to kind of calculate depreciation on a tax basis to make sure that we're in compliance basically uh, with the tax code. So oftentimes then you might be working with a bookkeeper who's going to depend on us as the tax preparer to calculate depreciation at least on a tax-based method. And then the question is, do we want the books to be kept on a tax-based method for depreciation, which is going to be a little bit distorted? Or do we want to have two depreciation methods, one for the books, one for the taxes, which will be a little bit more complex because now we have two different methods, but it would make more sense from a financial standpoint to have a depreciation not based on the tax code, but based on generally accepted accounting standards. And then, of course, the tax depreciation based on the tax code, trying to lower our tax obligations as low as possible while still being within the law. Now, that said, some small businesses won't have a whole lot of depreciation because maybe they're service businesses. So if you just got like gig work people, then then they might have like a microphone and this kind of stuff. But it's probably not going to be too difficult to depreciate that, especially these days, because you might be able to front load the depreciation, depreciating a lot of it up front. But many businesses, they require a capital investment, a lot of stuff up front. And that's kind of nice for some businesses because it actually stops other competition, right? That's going to be an entry fee that you have to pay to get into the business and uh, in those cases, we're going to have a lot more stuff that we got to deal with with depreciation uh, for. So that's just a bit of an intro into the topic. It's going to be more important. So if you're in the field of tax preparation, the question is, do I want to deal with larger businesses that have a lot of depreciable assets? Some some businesses like real estate have different kind of depreciation things that we have to be aware of, as opposed to small businesses, which probably have smaller things. Depreciation is not as big an issue. Uh, versus like like construction companies, for example, which probably have a lot of equipment that they have to deal with, possibly issues with leases versus capitalizing leases versus purchasing equipment and so on uh, and so forth. All right, so let's get into it. Depreciation. If property you acquire to use in your business is expected to last more than one year, you generally cannot deduct the entire cost of a business expense in the year you acquire it. Now, this is a, a general kind of method where the tax code basically pulled this from normal accounting principles, which is an accrual principle. And so even if you're on a cash-based method, the idea would be the reason the cash-based method works is because when you pay for something in cash, like paying for the utility bill, it's because the cash was pretty close to the time you actually used the utility energy and therefore it makes sense to deduct it. But if you pay for the utility bill and you were actually going to use the energy, you know, in like 10 years into the future, you prepaid the utility company for 10 years. Well, then now you've totally distorted your bookkeeping because because you would have front loaded. You pay for a lot of stuff up front, but you're not actually consuming it until future periods. This is most commonly seen in a similar way with like insurance, where you pay for something before you use it, oftentimes paying a year in advance, which is why that's the common prepaid example. And then the same concept is in play when you buy equipment. So if I buy a forklift, for example, I spend $30,000 on it. If I deduct the $30,000 in month one or year one, then it's going to distort things because really I'm planning on using that forklift for five to 10 years into the future. Therefore, 
I should be allocating it over the useful life. Now note that this one year is a little bit scary because you might say, wow, there's a lot of things I might buy for more than one. I might buy a, a giant thing of paper clips for like, you know, $20 that's going to last me five years or a whole thing of sticky notes that's going to last me a long time. So in practicality, for practicality reasons, if it costs you $20, then you might consider that to be like immaterial, right? So and therefore, it's not going to affect your taxes in a material way. And though, so therefore, you're probably not going to put something like that on the books as an asset. So in practical terms, there's probably a dollar kind of limitation that would say if I go below that limitation, it might not be worth putting on the books as a depreciable asset because I would I would get it's it's a small amount anyways, it's easier to expense it. Now, if you're in question, however, you could put it on the books as a depreciable asset. And currently you might be able still to depreciate most or not all of it because of the front because of the 179 deductions and uh, the, the, the upfront depreciations, which we'll talk about later. OK, so you must spread the cost over more than one tax year and deduct part of it each year on Schedule C. So instead of deducting it as equipment expense, we're going to put it on the books as an asset. Remember that the Schedule C is an income statement. We don't have a balance sheet, but the depreciation schedules are a piece of the balance sheet, giving the supporting information for equipment, property, plant, and equipment. So this method of deducting the cost of business property is called depreciation. So it must be property you own. So clearly when we're thinking about property, that like if we have equipment and we're depreciating it, that would mean that we own the equipment. Now, this comes into a, a another kind of confusing component in terms of, well, what if I leased the property? If I leased like the forklift, for example, you would think that I would be able to deduct the cost of the lease when I pay the lease payments, which would be the case unless it's going to be a capital lease. And that often happens with certain types of businesses, in which case it looks like it's a lease in terms of how the form is structured. But it also looks like it's a purchase because because the lease terms are such that you could have purchased it basically uh, in a similar. In other words, if, if the lease, if you're locked into the lease for five years and you're going to pay basically the full cost of the property over the five years, it looks like you basically purchased it. And in that case, even though it's a lease, it might be something you have to put on the books as a, an asset, right? So that gets a little bit uh, confusing, but usually it's fairly straightforward. If we bought something, then we, then we own it. So it must be used in business or held to produce income. So we didn't buy the forklift because we want to resell it. That would mean the forklift is now inventory. We bought the forklift because we want to lift stuff on the fork of the forklift as uh, part of our business. We're using it to, to, to make money, to generate revenue. You can never depreciate inventory explained in chapter two because it is not held for use in your business. In other words, the same thing, the forklift in this case, could have been inventory if we're in the business of buying and selling forklifts. But if we're not in the business of buying or selling forklifts, we sell other stuff needing a forklift in order to facilitate our operations, then it would be property, plant, and equipment. And if we bought it rather than, if we bought it and it's ours, we would depreciate it rather than expensing it in year one, typically. So it must have a useful life that extends substantially beyond the year it is placed in service. That's the point. If we depreciate it in year one from an accounting standpoint, it distorts our comparison of income statement year over year because we bought it to consume it over multiple years. We're going to consume the forklift through using it f multiple years into the future. So it must have a determinable useful life, which means that it must be something that wears out, decays, gets used up, becomes obsolete or loses its value from natural causes. I feel like they're describing me right now. Are you talking about me again? Anyway, you can never depreciate the cost of land because land does not wear out, become obsolete or get used up. So when we when we buy anything, the thing that we're purchasing typically is going to be reduced in in value. It's going to deteriorate over time. 
the forklift. As soon as we drive it off the lot, it's going to it's going to go down in value. Every other piece of equipment will typically do the same. It's going to be costing less over time. Now, there's going to be one exception to that. You might think you say, well, what about real estate? If I buy a real estate, it might go up over time. And that's true. But part of the real estate still deteriorates, meaning the actual physical building depreciates. The reason it goes up in value is typically for other things that, that happen, such as whatever happens around that area and, and the value of basically the land, you know, it possibly goes up. So that's why real estate gets kind of messy, right? Everything other than real estate, usually if it's equipment of some kind, goes down in value over time. And it's just a question of how we're going to value that, that decrease or estimate how much it's going to go down with real estate. It might go up in value also with real estate. We can break it out into its two essential components. We have the building, which will deteriorate, and then the land. Land doesn't deteriorate, and so therefore it's non-depreciable. Uh, now, you might say it does deteriorate over time, but we're talking billions of years as opposed to human lifetimes, and therefore land, for all intents and purposes, we're, is not going to depreciate, and therefore we'll keep it. We, we don't depreciate the land. It just is what it is. So, so you can never depreciate the cost of land. Okay, so, it must, so what does that mean? That means that when we, when we buy land, that's going to add an added level of complication because now we have to break out the purchase of the land, which will be for one lump sum amount typically, between the cost of the building and the cost of the land because the cost of the building is depreciable, which is good for taxes because then we get to deduct it, but the cost of land is not which is typically not good for taxes because then we don't get to deduct the depreciation on it, allocating the cost over the useful life. So it must not be, be uh, accepted property. This includes property placed in service and disposed of in the same year. So if you bought it and you disposed of it in the same year, then obviously for whatever reason, you're not holding it long-term, which is the point of depreciating it. It looks like you made a speculation play if that was the case, right? You bought something and then sold it right afterwards. And what the IRS is going to be skeptical of is someone trying to buy property and then depreciate it in the current year, front loading the depreciation with accelerated depreciation methods like double declining makers method and then 179 or special depreciations of some kind and then selling it, you know, like right after or some something like that. Where, they gonna, where they're trying to take advantage of a, of a deduction without actually buying the equipment with the intent of using it in the business rather than as some kind of tax strategy or something. So repairs. In general, you do not depreciate the cost of repairs or maintenance if they do not improve the property. So this is another kind of messy situation that comes into play because if I, if I then have maintenance on, say, my forklift, for example, do I have to then record the maintenance on the forklift as an asset and then depreciate the asset over the useful life? Typically, no. Why? Because it's repairs. So now you're repairing the forklift. It's similar to like the utility bill now at this point in time because you pay the utility bill as you consume the utilities. You pay for the repairs of the forklift to basically get the forklift back into working order. In other words, you're not usually paying the repairs of the forklift in order to really extend the useful life past what you originally thought it would be. You're trying to keep it in maintained standard order, which takes normal routine repair and therefore should be expensed in the period that you know the repairs are taking place. But if you did massive repairs on the forklift, changing the engine of it or something like that, or changing the use of the forklift, now you've you've changed its purpose, you've extended its life, and then maybe you'd have to put it on the books as an asset and depreciate it. So instead, you deduct these on the Schedule C, line 21. So what ends up happening in practice is if you're doing taxes, a lot of times you'll look at this repairs expense line and it'll be very large. Like if you see a big dollar amount in repairs, then you might drill down on it or you might imagine that the IRS will drill down on repairs and see if they see big dollar amounts, they're going to say, hey, maybe they should have capitalized the repairs. Or also, 
any place where you can imagine someone puts or expenses something instead of depreciating it, meaning they bought the forklift and they put it under tools and equipment or something on the income statement. So they just expensed the whole 30,000 instead of putting it on the books as an asset and depreciating it. That will result in large dollar amounts in the expense items. And if you did a ratio analysis comparing similar businesses, it's likely that you can easily see those big dollar amounts that have been put into expense accounts instead of putting them on the books as an asset. So, so you want to be, so you can kind of double check that as a tax prepared, depending on how much detail you want to, you want to get in to it so that you can make sure that, or reduce the likelihood that there's an audit or something due to a ratio calculation like that, where you can kind of see someone trying to expense something when it might should have been capitalized and depreciated. So improvements are amounts paid for betterments to your property, restorations of your property, or work that adopts your property to a new or different uh, use. So again, improvements different than repairs because it's, it's increasing the value of the property or changing its use in some way. Election to capitalize repair and maintenance costs that do not improve your property. You can make an election to, to, to treat certain repairs or replacements in your trade or business as improvements subject to depreciation. So the, usually the question would be, well, why would you want to do that? Normally that wouldn't be the thing that you would want to do for taxes because usually you're trying to increase the expenses, trying to expense things earlier rather than later because of the time value of money. So, so in other words, depreciation is basically allocating the cost over a longer period of time. And so it's just a timing difference as to taking the deduction today versus the lifetime of the, the asset that you're gonna depreciate over. Usually you want to take it earlier. Why? Because of the time value of money, I'd rather get the deduction today rather than in the future. But there are some times when that might not be the case because for example, this year, I might have uh, a low income. I might, I might even have, you know, I might not be earning much income this year and I expect to earn more income next year. Well, if I, if I, that means that the deductions aren't as valuable this year because of the progressive tax system, meaning if I don't have much income, I'm going to be at the lower brackets of, uh, of taxation. So another deduction is only going to give me a benefit lowering my income, which I'm already paying a pretty low tax on. Whereas next year, if I expect my income to rise dramatically, that could boost me into higher tax brackets. And therefore, I could imagine a situation where I would rather take the deduction next year than this year because I expect to be in higher tax brackets because my income's going to be higher. So in any case, this election is available if you treat these amounts as capital expenditures on your books or record a regularly used in your computing your income and expenses. All right, depreciation method. So the method for depreciating most business and investment property placed in service after 1986 is called the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, otherwise known as MAKERS. And so that sounds very intimidating, most likely, if you've never heard of that before. But if you have if you have any bookkeeping experience, then you've probably heard of like the straight line depreciation method and then possibly a double declining depreciation method. So that when you think about depreciation, just the first thing to kind of conceptualize is, okay, if I bought a piece of equipment that is more expensive, say it's a $10,000 piece of equipment, and I can't depreciate it in the current year because I'm going to use it for multiple years in the future, then how would I allocate it to those years into the future? Well, what would I need to know? I need to know how long it's going to last. Maybe it's going to last like 10 years, right? And then I need to, and then, and then I need to know the cost of it. I said it was going to be uh, $10,000. So I could just say, well, if it's going to last 10 years, I'm going to take the $10,000 divided by 10, and then I'll de depreciate it evenly over the 10 year time frame. So that would be what we would call a straight line depreciation method. Most other depreciation methods are, are going to be some variant on the straight line method. So you could think about that as the baseline. And then you might say, well, it might be the case that I'm like, if I drive the forklift off the lot, then it's gone down in value substantially in year one, meaning I'm going to consume more of the cost in year one 
than in later years. And therefore, the straight line method doesn't, I, it would be more accurate for me to front load the depreciation, taking more depreciation in the, in the current years, less in the latter years, still depreciating the total cost of the, of the property, $10,000 in this case, over the useful life, 10 years in this case, but having more of it front loaded than at the end. We, and, that, and the most common accelerated depreciation method is called double declining method. And so that's just, that's what the double declining method is trying to do. That makes sense even from a generally accepted accounting bookkeeping principles. The maker's convention is usually a form of that double declining method. The one other twist that comes into play or a couple other twists with makers that we'll talk more about in uh, later presentations is that you, you have then the useful life. Who gets to determine the useful life? Well, if it was generally accepted accounting principles, you would want to be accurate with that and therefore management would determine it and try to make it right. But for taxes, if you let us, the taxpayer, determine the useful life, it's likely they're going to be very small or short useful lives because I want to depreciate more up front. I want more depreciation to lower my taxes. So therefore, the tax code has to force us to say this is the exact type of property and this is the number of periods that you are allowed to depreciate over. So it's more restrictive than generally accepted accounting principles, for example. And uh, they also use a convention. The question would be, well, what if I bought the equipment in the middle of the year? I bought it on February you know, 23rd. Do I have to depreciate it in that partial part of the year per day? Or do I have to like depreciate it like as if I bought it in the middle of the month or like a half year convention? So usually we assume we bought it like in the middle of the year unless, 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 which we'll talk about later. So that would be a half year convention. So whenever I bought it, I assume I bought it in the middle of the year. So I get half a year's depreciation. All right, that's the general idea. We'll talk more about it later. But that's makers is discussed in detail in publication 946 if you want to get into more detail there. Then we have the section 179 deduction. So you can elect to deduct a limited amount of the cost of certain depreciable property in the year you place the property in service. This deduction is known as the section 179 deduction. So this is where we completely deviate now from generally accepted accounting principles. Up until now, the tax code is taking best practices for the most part from accepted accounting principles saying, okay, straight line, good, that makes sense. Depreciating, that makes sense. Double declining, even that makes sense. Front loading the depreciation. But then we're saying we also have this added upfront depreciation. Where does that come from? Most likely lobbyists, right? But for the, the politicians will argue that, of course, they're doing that to stimulate the economy and this and that. Obviously, it's the popular thing to do. Uh, so, so it's you know you, you get more deductions up front, and you can take the deductions up front. So many times, it's kind of like, well, you told me that I can't just take the forklift as an expense in year one, but then you made me depreciate it over the certain life of the depreciation. But then you gave me these upfront bonus depreciations, which basically allowed me to take the entire expense up front anyways. So what was the purpose of forcing me not to just expense it on a cash-based method if you're just going to allow me to then depreciate it all up front, which is basically expensing it on a cash-based method? We end up with that whole thing. And why does that happen? Because the tax code's kind of messy, right? So that so then the question so this would be allowing us that upfront depreciation complete deviation again from normal you know depreciation calculations. So the maximum amount you can elect to deduct during 2023 is generally 1,160,000. Uh, higher limits apply in certain property to certain property. This limit is generally reduced by the amount by which the cost of property placed in service during the tax year exceeds. $2,890,000. So the total amount of depreciation, including the section 179 deduction, you can take for a passenger automobile you use in your business and first place in service in 2023 is $12,200. $20,200 if you take the special depreciation allowance, another kind of alteration of it. Uh, for qualified passenger automobiles placed in service in 2023. 
Now, the automobiles is another area of issues because when you talk about passenger automobiles, for example, you might say, yeah, I use my car to drive you know, from here to there, and I need to do that for business purposes. And it's like, but my car costs you know, $200,000. And obviously, the, the, you know, if you were a tax preparer driving, driving you know, your normal <laughs> car back and forth to work, it's like, well, wait a second. I'm pretty sure you can go from A to B without like a $200,000 uh, car. So it kind of seems like although you're using the car for business, there's kind of a personal component to it. But it's kind of hard to tease out the personal side from the business side because, you know, some people's businesses is to look is to look snazzy, right, or whatever. So 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 it's kind of hard to say. So but you can see why the IRS is going to be skeptical of over and front loading depreciation on fancy cars that look like they're there for personal use and are above and beyond the need of driving, you know, from A to B for business purposes. And so you have these special limitations that go into place for automobiles. And then you have all these rules that, well, what if it's, what if the car is over a certain amount? What if it's a work truck that's actually expensive work and this and stuff that so we'll get into that later, but just know that cars are another uh, issue as we saw before also with automobiles, which could be used partially for personal use and for business use. In which case we also have to compare the mileage method as we saw possibly to the depreciation method, which one's going to be higher or better for us in a particular situation. All right. Special rules apply to trucks and vans. Now, again, why would that be? Because you can say, well, the IRS is really skeptical about people driving around really expensive cars, but what if they were really expensive trucks or something, in which case they aren't personal or luxury items. They're there because they need an expensive or specialized work truck. Well, then you would think the deduction should be legitimate and so on. Okay, so for more information, see publication 946. It explains what property qualifies for the deduction, what limits apply to the deduction, and when and how to recapture the deduction. Caution! Your section 179 election for the cost of any sport utility vehicle, an SUV, and certain other vehicles is limited to $28,900. For more information, see the instructions for Form 4562 or Publication 946. Listed property. You must follow special rules and record keeping requirements when depreciating listed property. Listed property includes any of the following. Most passenger automobiles, most other property used for transportation, any property of a type generally used for entertainment, recreation, amusement. Again, the IRS, of course, you can see why they're kind of skeptical of these type of items, people abusing the tax code to deduct things that possibly could have more of a personal use than a directly business type of necessity. Form 4562, use Form 4562 depreciation amortization if you are claiming any of the following. Depreciation on property placed in service during the current year, a Section 179 deduction, which is kind of like a form of depreciation in essence. Depreciation on any listed property regardless of when it was placed in service. So we'll get into more detail on the, some specifics on the depreciation in future presentations.